<laughs> Only some comment, comments about uh, energy payback and pollution. <coughs> this is a comparison about the CO2 emissions during lifetime for combined cycle gas. Combined cycle. All of these are pure uh, fossil fuel, uh, fuel nuclear renewables, PV now, PV future. You can see here we are in order of magnitude below the emission of uh, fossils. Uh, higher emission than nuclear. And the same order of magnitude are either renewables, wind, uh, biomass. Uh, in the future, less material is expected to be used for the solar cells, and this reduces the emission. 15, this is our equivalent CO2 grams per kilowatt hour generated. Uh, this is only one of the components of the pollution that has to, that, uh, has to be studied. There are a lot of other points. I will not show the other point, but there's, there's people in labs that are studying the problem associated with with pollution in the uh, fabrication of the devices. One usual question with the silicon solar cells is, how much time do I need to recover the energy I use to produce the solar cells? Uh, well, here are some uh, numbers for multi-crystalline silicon modules multi-crystalline ribbon is another way of uh, growing the uh, silicon uh, wafers. In monocrystalline, we are talking about two years to recover. This is the uh, this is solar cell and the lamination of uh, solar cell interconnected. Here, uh, the frame of the solar module is like uh, addition is aggregated uh, and uh, also the BOS is the balance of system. All the, the other things we have to use to, uh, to connect the solar modules to the, to the external circuit. This means the, the batteries, is ne if necessary, the, the uh, regulators, the inverters. Well, we are talking about two years for recovering the energy we have used to produce the cells and the modules and all the all the things required. And it's expected that these numbers in the few, near future will go down to a year or less than a year. It should be mentioned that the lifetime of a of solar modules could be 25 years or more. Well let's go to the applications. What kind of uh, application we have. First of all, I will mention what is a module. A module is a PV system is, uh, is based on a PV uh, module. The photovoltaic module produces direct current, uh, 12, 24, 48 volt, depending on the number of solar cells connected in series. Uh, the normal way to, to define the power of a, a solar module is the watt peak. The watt peak is the, the, the power the, the module will generate when it receives one kilowatt per square meter. This is a typical uh, moon time of a clear day. This is a one kilowatt per square meter solar radiation standard here in Montevideo. In Buenos Aires, uh, 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 summer also not not only uh, 
in summer we can have one kilowatt per square meter. The typical power of a module is between 80 to 280 watt peak. And they generate this number times the 4 kilowatt hour per, per square meter per day I mentioned before. This module generates 300 to 1,100 watt hours per day. Sorry. Spanish. Uh, the PV system is uh, consists of uh, PV modules and uh, the balance of system. Balance of system are all the other things you have to add to complete the system. Batteries, charge controllers to avoid uh, overcharging the battery. DC uh, direct uh, current to alter current inverters, if alter current is needed, structures, tracking system if you want to move the servo to follow the movement of the, of the sun, all this is called the palace of system. What can we do with, uh, with solar modules or with PV systems, anything that can be done with electricity? The, the, the main uses in our countries in Latin America until now are the standalone systems, not for space but for rural electrification, agricultural uses, telecommunications. <coughs> uh, all of these are standalone systems, not connected to the grid. They require uh, storage. public illumination, water pumping, cathodic protection. Most of them are in rural areas, far away from the grids. Finally, the grid connected system are all the system where you, in principle, you do not require uh, storage. You uh, have the PV system connected to the grid and you deliver electricity to the grid when you have solar radiation and you do not deliver when you do not have solar radiation and are two kinds of installation basically uh, in buildings there are small installation and in power plants small installations. The previous uh, market the applications uh, that I mentioned before are uh, competitive nowadays. In most cases, the, the less expensive way to provide electricity to in rural areas is photovoltaic. In the case of grid connected, uh, the market nowadays is essentially subsidized. It requires uh, special tariffs to compete with the uh, with, uh, conventional energy. It's not the case anywhere, but in most cases this, this is necessary. Uh, experts in this uh, subject uh, are um, expecting that the grid parity, the grid parity when the, the cost of the electricity generated with photovoltaic will reach the cost of conventional energy, it's expected to be reached in three or to seven years during this decade, depending on the cost of conventional energy in each place and also the solar radiation there. It's not the same in uh, California than in uh, the north or the United States or, the, or Tierra del Fuego in Argentina. Uh, the same uh, system generate two or three times uh, with a good uh, solar radiation, in the case of Spain, for example, uh, versus the, when you compare this with Germany, or the north of Germany. But this grid connected to the system is very simple. It's a set of modules 
uh, with an inverter, the DC AC inverter that generates other current and uh, a meter bidirectional or not you can inject the whole electricity to the grid or inject only the difference between the, the electricity <coughs> you need in the house and the electricity generated in the modules. These are some examples in Europe. Atrium in a railway station in Germany, windows in Holland. In this case are semi-transparent uh, windows. Part of the energy is used. Yes. Um, on your previous slide, you're talking about DC to AC converters. Have, have there been any? Is there been any research looking into making DC plugs in houses? Because all of our electronics, which is mainly what we're using for the houses, have AC to DC converters in them already. Um, sorry, okay, I have a yeah. question. Um, like all, all of our electronics have AC to DC converters ah, okay. in them, yeah. yes. and with solar cells, we're going DC to AC to go back to DC. Okay. Has there been any research on putting DC outlets in houses? That that's uh, that are application. It's not uh, necessary to to use a, an inverter if you can go directly to DC applications. Yes, that's a, a, an inter very interesting use of PV. If you can have uh, uh, all the, the equipment in, in DC, in the case of the equipment that are DC, it's better not to try, uh, to go from DC to AC and the AC from AC again to DC. Um, the problem is that most of the equipment in the, in the house are alternate current. But it's a very interesting application that uh, much more efficient, um, uh, much more reliable. You don't have intermediate electronic uh, devices to, to go, go uh, to to AC and back to DC. For groups in Colorado also. <coughs> what about the PV market? I will show you some graphs of what is going on in the world. First, in the first with the technology. This is very interesting to, to notice that uh, up to 80% or more, these are the years, it is in the participation of each component in the, in the total uh, market of PV. 80% or more is silicon, crystalline silicon. This has been happening from 30 years ago. Many times, expert in the subject mentioned that it was coming, uh, thin films were coming, they will replace uh, silicon. Uh, the history shows that till now this couldn't be possible. Silicon subsists and subsists with a very high uh, participation in the, the PV market. Uh, this will probably change, but uh, I don't know. Many times in the past, uh, this has been mentioned and uh, has not happened. Uh, during the last years, cadmium uh, telluride has been increasing its participation. And nowadays, it's more important. This is 2007. I don't have the number to do some 2010, for example. But it's more important, cadmium telluride. And it's a very high manufacture company in the U.S. of cadmium telluride solar cells it, and with very uh, cost-competitive um, products. What, what these are, are different variations of crystallite. This is amorphous silicon with microcrystalline silicon. This is copper, indium, selenide, 
it seemed to be some years ago to be an interesting alternative. Yeah. Nowadays, it has almost disappeared. I don't know what, what will, will happen in the future. As in uh, most things, China is growing very, very quickly. Uh, nowadays, the uh, main provider of, uh, of the PV market is China, followed by Germany, Japan, Taiwan, US. This has changed in the last years. Uh, three or four or five years ago, Germany was the the main provider of PV uh, modules. This is the evol evolution of the uh, installed PV capacity. Uh, this is the megawatts per year installed in each country. <laughs> Only some examples. I'm sorry, I, I don't have the, the numbers for 2009 and now only some part of the information for 2010. I wanted to show in particular Germany. Germany is not a country with a lot of solar energy, but it ha has a very aggressive uh, policy for promoting solar energy. And you can see here, how is it grow? They, they have installed in 2010 more than <coughs> seven gigawatts in the year. And they have a con continued growth. Spain uh, seems to have the same uh, tendency, but they have a very uh, severe crisis, and uh, you can see here. They have also uh, had um, some policies too um, aggressive, but not sustainable. And they now they have uh, some problems. You can see here in 2009, from being the the world uh, leader in 2008, now are they are in the fifth uh, in the fifth place in the world uh, after Germany, um, I think Italy, France, um, Japan, I think. This is installed PV capacity by 2008. The total capacity installed up to uh, year 2008. Again, we can see 40 percent or more is in Germany. Again, a country with, uh, with low solar energy, followed by Spain, Japan. California has a very important contribution. Uh, California historically have had a policy to promoting uh, renewables. Uh, they have a lot of solar radiation. Uh, well, you can see here European Union rest, South Korea and the rest of the world. This is a PV yearly installation up to the year 2009, 2009 due to the crisis in 2008 the, the value is the same about 6 gigawatts a year 2010 appear again the, the, the growth the market and the estimated installation in 2012 it's expected to be about 40 gigawatts in the year. This curve is the increase from year to year. But I will try to explain this graph. It's quite complicated, but I will try to. This is the cost in euros, euros, how do you say in English, euros? Euros per kilowatt hour 
This is sun irradiation in kilowatt hour per square meter per year. Uh, you can see here the solar irradiation in Germany is less, is about the half the solar irradiation, for example, in Spain or in Australia. This curve represents the price of <coughs> in euros in euros in per kilowatt hour with provided with photovoltaic if the system costs three euros per watt peak installed. There are two prices involved in this graph. One is the installation cost and the other one is the the, the cost per kilowatt hour generated during the life time of the, uh, of, the, of the installation. This curve corresponds to an initial investment of 3 euros per watt peak. This circles represent the uh, cost in euros per kilowatt hour in each country, the conventional energy. Italy Let's say 0 0.25 or 0.23 euros per kilowatt hour of conventional energy. A PV system in Italy with this initial investment will be about 0.2 euros per kilowatt hour generated. This means that in Italy nowadays is competitive with this cost of installation of this uh, real cost nowadays. This is not the case of Germany or France. I don't have here the values of uh, countries in Latin America, but I think in our countries uh, it's not competitive nowadays. The competitiveness is nowadays value in Italy, California, in Hawaii, but the, the cost of conventional energy is very high and they have a lot of solar radiation. This curve represents what I mentioned before, the grid parity. Some numbers more recent number than the war, the one I, I showed in the previous graphs. PV power started by 2009 in the European Union was 16 gigawatts, much more than any other country, almost order of magnitude. Anyone? In 2009 in the European Union there was generated 13.5 terawatt hour with PV with an 83% increase from previous year. This shows again a very aggressive policy for promoting this type of installation. In the case of Spain, 2010, photovoltaic provided 2.1% of electricity required for the whole country, with some months with peaks of 4%. It's a very important number for photovoltaics. I'm sorry to mention here only in the case of Argentina, I don't have the, the information of other countries in Latin America. The European Union had a milestone of 20% with renewables by the year 2020, and I am almost sure they will arrive that number. In the case of Spain, they have, have arrived in the milestones before the, the moment they estimated previously. Uh, Argentina has a, a law, this number, which uh, defined 8% of electricity with renewables in 10 years. This law is from 2006. 
uh, is um, we have to uh, reach this 8% in 2016. I don't know if we will reach them this number, but uh, there, there are some tendencies nowadays that we are seeing with the renewables. I will show some, uh, I will mention some comment before. The political action are feeding tariff, tariff, differential tariffs for uh, renewables. This is the way the German and Spain, for example, have promoted this, this uh, type of energy. Another point, a very important in the case of Argentina, is very important, uh, the elimination of direct and indirect subsidy to fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are subsidized in many countries. Uh, it's very uh, difficult to compete with subsidized uh, uh, fossil fuels. And also binding mechanisms uh, is necessary to, to generate laws and regulation that uh, oblige to use uh, renewables in new houses, for example. This has uh, been one of the ways that uh, developed countries uh, have uh, promoted renewables, in particular solar energy. Some data or some comments on, uh, in Latin America. In Argentina, in 2010, only rural standalone applications. Last year, uh, the power plant, PV power plant of 1.2 megawatts have been installed in San Juan province. This is, uh, is uh, working in this uh, delivering energy to the, to the grid nowadays. There's also a very important tender from ENARSA. ENARSA is a national uh, company of energy uh, for 1,000 megawatts with renewables, most of them with wind, but 20 megawatts of them are with PV. This will be installed during, I think, the next year or so. Uh, in the case of Brazil, I have the information 20 megawatts have been installed till now, but only 0 0.2 megawatts are grid connected. There have been no uh, promotion, no policies for uh, promoting the grid connected system in Latin America. Brazil has uh, very high radiation in expensive, expensive electricity rates for households. These are two points important that uh, make the solar energy more competitive in Brazil. In the case of Me Mexico, the numbers are similar. Uh, well, uh, Argentina, I haven't uh, mentioned that the numbers are, uh, are lower than this one uh, nowadays. The stock capacity may be uh, about 10 megawatts. Uh, let me uh, mention that we are talking about uh, orders of magnitude less than in the developed countries. We are uh, very far from, from, from the application in the, in the developed countries. In the case of Mexico, there are tariffs and tax incentives for solar under preparation. They are going to promote the, this type of installations. Well, I finish in this point with uh, the rest of the application. I, I, I don't know if the, any questions or comments about this point. No, I continue to the space applications. Well, the space applications uh, have several uh, differences. Even though the, the devices used are, are very similar to those of terrestrial uses, uh, the conditions are very different. The spa space environment uh, has a lot of particles from the sun or uh, in the Van Halen uh, ring of the, of the Earth, but uh, a lot of protons and electrons that uh, in inside of uh, go, go into the materials that you put there. Uh, this produces damage on the on the devices, in particular on the on the solar cells. <coughs> uh, ultraviolet radiation is very high there. You have uh, you don't have the protection of the atmosphere. 
high thermal amplitude also uh, occurs there because uh, in some moments the satellites go into the shadow of the, the Earth and they go, the temperature goes down depending on the orbit to minus 50 degrees centigrade or almost to minus 170 degrees centigrade. Uh, on the other extreme, we have 80 to 100 degrees centigrade. Uh, you have cycles on the, on the device you put there in an orbit. The requirements are reliability, quality assurance is very important there. Missions cost a lot and uh, you cannot go and uh, repair anything there. And um, the photovoltaic systems in the satellite are the only source of energy. If they fail, the whole mission fails. Uh, mission of uh, observation of the Earth can cost uh, 200 to 300 million dollars. Uh, quality assurance is it's the point. Uh, in many cases, uh, rest, uh, the area available is uh, very restricted. High efficiency is required to minimize the area or to maximize the generation. Uh, the device must be resistant to radiation damage, ultraviolet, and also atomic oxygen in some orbits. There is atomic oxygen there. And it should be light. Each kilogram you want to put in orbit is very expensive. One of the most used solar cells uh, in satellites are triple junction solar cells based on indium gallium phosphide, indium gallium arsenide, three pipe semiconductors, or germanium, are very complicated, have a lot of layers. Uh, the way of producing these devices is with a metal organic chemical vapor deposition. One cell, solar cell of this characteristic and 27 square centimeters can cost about $300. Uh, the cost is orders of magnitude. When in the case of terrestrial application, we are talking about one or two dollars per, per watt peak. Here we can talk about $300 per watt peak, two orders of magnitude. And the efficiency of these cells is about 27, 30%. The last part of my talk, I will be uh, summarizing what we are doing in the Atomic Energy Commission uh, in Argentina. We work in uh, terrestrial application and in space applications with more emphasis during the last year in space, but we are coming back to the Earth nowadays. Uh, we are working in uh, research and development in solar cells, silicon 3.5, sports space and terrestrial application, characterization techniques. We are develop, uh, developing uh, solar radiation sensors for terrestrial application and also for space some consulting and technological questions. Uh, we collaborate with the, this is the national standard uh, institution in Argentina. We are collaborating the development of standards there for in particular for PV applications. And uh, from some months ago, we began to work in the, we are proposing a project to promote in Argentina grid connected PV system that uh, nowadays uh, uh, only a few uh, cases, very small cases of PV system grid connected in urban areas. The space application we are, have been working during the last years in 2001 with 
some uh, small project before uh, we began to work in this, uh, in this subject in 1995-1996, but more, with more emphasis uh, from 2001. We are working in the development of solar arrays for, for low Earth orbits. The Earth orbits are orbits uh, uh, in the range of 400 to 6, 7, 800 kilometers high. In particular, we are involved with the Aquarius Agne mission. It's a collaboration with CONAI, the uh, National Space Agency, Commission uh, Nacional de Actividades Espaciales, Space Agency of Argentina and NASA from the US. We are also uh, developing the solar array for the two SAOCOM missions, SAOCOM 1A and 1B. This is a collaboration of our National Space Agency with the Italian Space Agency. And we have also provided some solar sensor for a Brazilian satellite. Nowadays we are developing an, an experiment for a geostationary satellite. The geostationary satellites uh, are um, not low Earth orbits, are orbits at 27,000 kilometers height from the Earth. And we are evaluating also the possibility of providing uh, solar arrays for a communication satellite, national uh, communication satellite. Well, some photographs. This is the sac a satellite. This is a small satellite that has, has, has been in orbit during 1999. Then we put some solar sensor and small module for testing the solar cells. This was the case of silicon solar cells that were tested in this satellite. For the integration of solar array, we have uh, installed, uh, we have a facility, an uh, integration facility that is a clean room with filtered air. This is classified as the 10,000 clean room. This is the place where we uh, uh, produce the, the solar arrays for satellites. Uh, as in the Atomic Energy Commission, there are a lot of installations that can provide, provide particles for testing materials. In particular, we have there a linear tandem accelerator, tandem is the name of the accelerator, that can provide protons, protons in the energy similar to the, the energies that you can see in the, outside the atmosphere. And we have installed the chamber connected to this accelerator in order to, to test devices uh, under uh, simulating the environmental outside the atmosphere. This means um, vacuum, protons, temperature, and illumination. You can, we can illuminate through a window, we can illuminate the show itself, for example, inside the chamber and produce also changes in the temperature of the, uh, of the sample in order to, to analyze it under different conditions the, the device we are irradiated with protons. Well, we have developed all the, all the processes for the integration, not the cells. The cells are only two or three uh, enterprises in the world that produce these very sophisticated solar cells. We are working in the development of the, of the technology for uh, producing these solar cells, but in the case of the, the mission we have been working on, the solar cells come from the United States, uh, from a, an, enter, uh, an enterprise, MCOR. Uh, we have developed all the processes for soldering and welding in, for the interconnection of the cells. Uh, this requires a lot of tests for quality assurance during the process, like uh, pull tests on the, on the, on the solder 
uh, interconnect in order to, to verify the mechanical properties of the, of the soldiers. We have also developed the process for cover glass bonding in vacuum. Uh, the, this is a main difference in, between the solar model for terrestrial and space application. Terrestrial application is that you use a, a, a glass covering all, all, all the module. In the case of uh, space application, because uh, the importance of the, uh, of the white, uh, you don't want to have a lot of glass uh, that is very expensive to put it in orbit, you put only uh, very thin glasses on each solar cell. This is a 0.1 millimeter thickness uh, cover glass. The other point, very important, when you put this cover, when you bone this cover glass to the solar cell, you, you cannot not leave their bubbles. If you leave their bubbles, these bubbles have the pressure, air pressure standard in the air, and this will be a problem when we are in vacuum. This can broken the, the, the cover glass. That's the, the that's why you you. Uh, the cover glass bonding is uh, produced in, in vacuum. Uh, during the process, you have to test the solar cells and all, also the final product, the modules. We have developed or, or uh, buy solar simulators for testing the solar cells or for <coughs> testing the, the old solar, solar modules. This is a mission where we have been working on. The site the mission is a collaboration between NASA and Monae. NASA provides the Aquarius salinity microwave instrument, the main instrument of the, of the satellite, and the launch vehicle is provided by NASA. And uh, Conae Argentina provides the platform. The platform is the satellite. Uh, the solar panels are provided by the Atomic Energy Commission for Conai and they are integrated to the satellite. <coughs> the main objective, scientific objective of this satellite is to look for new type of information from, in particular from ocean salinity measurements. There are other objectives, but this is the main objective of the satellite, this is scientific <coughs> objective related to climatic change. The satellite weights 100, 1,000, uh, I'm sorry, this is not the point in English, 1,600 kilograms in an orbit of 627 kilometers. It will be launched by a Delta II launcher. I won't go uh, I want to go into detail, but I, I should mention that uh, we have all the whole program of qualification and integration. Uh, this program included a lot of uh, tests uh, therm in thermal vacuum or in nitrogen, thermal cycling, between minus 100 and plus 100 degrees centigrade. This is to verify that the, the solar module will be appropriate for the environment that we will see in the, uh, in the orbit. And in the final part, we have uh, produced and fabricated the qualification model. It's a model similar to the, the one uh, in this part. Okay. Let's go. Uh, some photographs to finish. This is the solar modules in Brazil for testing. This is a solar panel on shaker. You have to vibrate the solar panel to, to confirm that it will uh, be uh, appropriate to, uh, for the moment of the launch. This is the, like the satellite at launch pad. You can see here much. Solar, the solar panel, uh, the test of the 
deployment of the solar panel. The solar panel is deployed once uh, the satellite is in orbit. And I think this is the last one. Final comments. We come back to the terrestrial application and final comments to summarize in the following lectures. Uh, rapid growth of grid connected PV. Global production capacity exceeds 10 gigawatts per year. Prices of modules are arriving to $1 at what peak. This was difficult to, to imagine uh, three or four years ago when the numbers were three or four what dollars per watt peak. 80% of crystalline silica. Uh, carbon telluride is growing very rapidly and the increasingly important share of China in the, in the market. The grid parity is expected in three or seven years. I haven't mentioned the, the very important point that I put it here in final comments. 2,000 million people in the world don't have electricity. It's a very, very important application of PV. The problem in these countries is that there is no money. Developed countries should put money to provide electricity to these countries. In Latin America, uh, I understand this insufficiency, insufficient research and development and human resources to have to work on it. This is probably uh, in Argentina it's clearly this. In the case of Brazil, I think uh, there are more labs in the part of research. Uh, I don't know here in Uruguay, but uh, I think we have to work on this point. Almost only standalone PV application we have to go to grid connected. Even though we have to continue working standalone for uh, the communities that don't have electricity from the grid. I think that aggressive policy for promoting renewables is not required. I think I finish here. Policies, what, what are some things that you have in mind? Like, what things should people support if there's. Sorry. In terms of aggressive policies, could you give some examples of what those look like? Some of the successful policies to promote solar cells? The, I, I mentioned the, the policies that have, have been used in, in Europe in particular. One of them is the the so-called feed-in tariff. Uh, it's a differential tariff, subsidized tariff for renewables. In the case, for example, of, of Germany, uh, they have defined a, a higher tariff for, for renewables that is decreasing uh, a long time. The idea is that uh, they promote the the market, the change of scale with the tariff, and this change of scale would reduce the costs. That's the idea. Uh, in, in Argentina, the, the, there are some applications, I, I don't know, in, in the rest of Latin America. In the case of Argentina, the, the law I mentioned uh, defines a differential tariff for renewables in general and for different renewables, different numbers. The idea of this is to uh, promote that uh, companies go into the market and uh, make this installation as, as a diversion. Uh, the other policies are subsidized. subsidized. Uh, in some cases, uh, I don't know in the case of, of photovoltaic, but in thermal applications in some countries, you are obliged to put solar energy in a new house. Uh, it's not, uh, you cannot decide to put it or not, you have to put it. 
that's another policy uh, that uh, can be used. Uh, well, I think this summarizes the, the points that they, uh, I think that the, the taxes are also some. The, the, the law in the case of Argentina uh, gives some advantages regarding taxes for renewable energies. that because in the U.S. we have this debate, right? So renewable energy for the purpose of global warming and whatnot, or renewable energy as a way to promote the economy. And there's disagreement as to those forces. So do you have the same discussion here? Yes. I, I don't know if I can make any comment on this, but this is a very important point, the promotion of economy associated with, with renewables in general. For example, from nuclear or others. I mean, we've seen that for solar cells, you need about two years to get the energy back. What about for the other power plants? Ah, the energy payback of the other sources, I don't, yeah. I don't know. 